So thanks very much for coming. Um, what we wanted to talk really about was about the foundation and the foundation strategy which we've developed for mental health. So this foundation historically has been very, very well known for its work within the cancer service. Obviously, you're in the, the Flinders Centre for Innovation in Cancer. This is one of our largest projects and one of the projects we've actually been more the proudest of. But for a long period of time, we've actually been supporting a wide range of research across the medical components and also about improving the environment in which our patients and loved ones actually come to the hospital. Two years ago, we worked really, really hard on looking at well, what was the next, next biggest challenge for us, and we identified that mental health was that challenge. And we're going to talk to you about the work we've been doing in the last two years and where we've actually got to at this point in time. We're also then going to do a little bit of work that uh, I'll explain some of our mental health research initiatives, and one of those focus today is eating disorders. And then we're actually going to talk about the impact that your money actually has within the eating disorder arena, which is enormous. So you actually have some of your colleagues here today from the eating disorder services. We also have some of our researchers here as well to actually share their expertise and their passion. But also to actually show you that every time you make a donation to us, what an impact that really does have on somebody's life. For those of you then who don't know, this was the, we launched the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation six weeks ago. This is a piece of work that we've been looking at in the development really for mental health. Now, why did we do it? Why would you want to actually tackle something as difficult as mental health? Because no one's really doing it in the way we'd like them to do it. No one's really now started to actually target and actually look for the reasons why. Why does a mental health issue occur? Why do so many people have a mental illness? So one in five people at any one time will experience a mental health illness. Why is it then that we've got some incredible services that are actually developed to actually provide care once a diagnosis has been made, but really we've actually stopped asking the questions about the early intervention, the question as to why an illness occurs, what's the trigger for it, what's been the drive, what's been the big impact. So we want to look at how can we actually change that conversation, how can we change the angle of the conversation. So we decided we'd actually develop a new mental health research foundation so we actually are the only mental health research foundation here in Australia. There are lots of institutes providing incredible interventions and incredible research, but not one of them actually has a foundation aligned to it that's actually generating income which will be invested back into those research findings. So we wanted to tackle and find the call, get the answer to why mental health occurs, but also to have a really, really bold vision statement. And our bold vision statement was to create a life free from mental illness. Wouldn't that be incredible? We've had those challenges where we wanted to have that conversation about having a life free of cancer, a life free of heart disease, a life free of diabetes. But no one's ever expected us to say, wouldn't it be incredible to have a life free of mental illness? We've got to that point in time where we've actually started just to expect that's actually going to happen. It's going to happen to people, and we just need to deal with it. And we're saying that's not good enough anymore. So, we can't do this on our own. We can't do any of the work we do here at the Foundation without every one of you in this room with us. You are incredibly important to us. But also we actually need to have a whole range of different partners to assist us to drive this change. So we've been really, really fortunate. Part of the work we've been looking at um, is about the development of a Foundation, but also the University and now are actually looking at the work of developing a Mental Health Research Institute. That will be the first Mental Health Research Institute here in South Australia. I think that's an incredible investment from a university, it's an incredible vision for the university to drive that change, and we have some incredible researchers. I'm not just saying that because one of them staring at me and nodding, but we actually do have some incredible world leaders in mental health research. We've also got those people who've got those dynamic questions. I remember um, listening to the Vice Chancellor do a presentation once, and he posed the question, you know, the best piece of research is the thing that's never been Googled before. Um, and I think when you start to look for those questions that you can't find on Google, that's an incredible starting place. So the university are a real strong partner for us. We, we can't do anything without them, because what's the point of actually fundraising for research if you've got no researchers to do it for you? We're also then working very, very closely with the South Australian Mental Health Commission. The Mental Health Commission this year, um, or in December of last year, launched the new Strategic Mental Health Plan for South Australia. It's a plan from 2017 to 2022. Um, it really looked at trying to identify a whole range of growth and development areas for our state. And it wasn't just looking about mental illness. It was actually looking at society as a whole. So looking at the impacts of education, looking at the impacts of employment, looking at the impacts of housing, as well as our health services systems. 
And we will get to Chris and his team to come and present more around that to you. The reason we've got that partnership with them is because very, very clearly in the strategic planning talks about that research is the answer. Only research will find the ways in which we can tackle the unanswerable, the ungoogleable question. And so it's been really, really clear that from a partnership with the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation, there's actually a funding stream that can drive the research that measure the impact of the changes they're putting into place. We've been, in South Australia, very uh, gone through quite a reform of mental health services. And one of the challenges that we've often had is trying to be able to measure the impact that had. Did it actually make the greatest improvement? Did it actually give better outcomes for people? Did it actually reduce mental distress? Now we know if one in five people are having a mental health illness, and we know that 45% of people experience mental illness throughout their whole lives, we know that's actually growing and getting worse. So we need to be able to measure and look at those impacts to actually make sure the, the research we drive does make the positive change. We're also working very closely then with Adelaide Primary Health Network. So the Primary Health Network looking at early intervention strategies. Um, we're also very proud of our partnership with the Adelaide Crows. So when we played um, Carlton, that was the first ever breakthrough um, mental health research football round. It's the first round within the AFL all focused on mental health. Um, and we're really, really proud of that partnership. The reason we've developed a partnership with the Crows and not obviously trying to upset any other football team that might be in um, Adelaide, is because of the fact in which they, they've got a passion to actually looking after the outcome and the, outcome and the in, outcomes for their own community. They've actually got a whole program on mental health and well-being within the club, which people don't know about. And they also do a, a children's program called the Growing With Gratitude program, which actually goes out to, at the moment, I think they hit their 500th school last week. And that's looking about building the resilience of, of children for the future. Um, they've got a passion about connecting with the community and they've got a passion about trying to tackle a very, very difficult arena, which is mental health. And so there's a perfect connectivity for us. We've also partnered with SAMRI. So SAMRI have, have their mind and brain theme. The um, word that's looking at there is looking at how we can actually support some of the research development and the partnership strategies that take place between Flinders University and SAMRI. And a couple of weeks ago, Amanda, um, our CEO and myself, met with SAPOL, we met with the Commissioner and the Deputy Commissioner, and we started to explain all about Breakthrough and the foundation that we're wishing to do. Um, they wanted to partner with us because they actually want to start to look at strategies about looking after their own colleagues. So they've identified that 25% of people within the uh, police force, when they're unwell, is because of a mental health issue. They also know that 50% of claims that take place through their workplaces to do with mental health. So they actually want to look at a targeted and a proactive strategy and we're looking at ways in which we can support and complement them to do that. So, we've talked about research, so what research are we actually going to do? How do you actually come up with a whole range of strategy and a funding stream to actually target where you're going to have the biggest impact? We really want to look at something that's going to help us find an early intervention and possibly a cure. On that route and on that journey, we also want to look at well, what's the interventions we can put in place that actually reduces the distress to somebody once they've got a diagnosis. So we decided we wanted to look at four key themes. Now, we won't make the decision on how that funding gets allocated. We'll have a, 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 a research committee, we'll have a research grant round, and we'll go through a real true um, academic <coughs> process to identify the best research for the best outcomes. But where are we going to focus it on? So we're going to focus it on four key areas. So the first one is precision research. So to actually actually drill down and look at what's actually happening in the brain that's causing a mental health issue. Really targeting and looking at asking those questions why. We want to look at early interventions. So we know, as with any illness, the earlier you get to start a treatment for somebody, the earlier you get to do a diagnosis, the earlier you get to identify trigger signs, the better outcomes you actually have for that person. And so why shouldn't we ask you those same questions within mental health? We then want to look at new technologies. A few weeks ago we had a presentation from uh, Naranja Vidigari where he was talking all about um, his breakthrough app. And that's about the utilisation of mobile phones and technology to actually give early warning signs and triggers. But there's a whole range of different technologies out there that we can actually start to explore and actually see if that's going to improve the outcomes for, for our consumers and for their families. And we want to drill down into finding what's the best way to do that. It's a mindless, mindless minefield of, of an arena and how do you actually target to get the best outcomes. And then we want to look at next generation therapy. 
So how do we actually translate our research back into clinical intervention, back into outcomes and positive outcomes for people, and actually closing that gap? One of the challenges we've had within mental health research is that from an, an identification of a, a new piece of research to translation to clinical practice, on average it's about 17 years. Now, I'm not sure if anyone else in the room thinks that's okay, but I actually think that's just much too large, it's too big a time. We really need to be looking at like, quicker translation, the quicker um, interventions in place, and actually driving change by evidence. So they're the four key areas. So, how can we do this? What do we need to do? So every donation we actually get goes towards our research. And we've got some examples of the impacts that you can actually have today. We actually want to look at um, how we then target initially with four specific pieces of research. That helps with our launch. We're a charity. We do our business by selling mental health. It's a beautiful sale to actually have. It's a beautiful area to talk about. It's something that most of our, all our team are very passionate about and all our researchers are passionate about. But we can't do it unless we've actually got some really, really good stories. So we have got some great stories of people who've, who've been very honest and open about their experience with their loved ones and their family members and themselves. And that takes a great deal of courage to actually do that. Our job then is to actually share that story and then start to connect with the community. The wider community connectivity we get, the better a chance of we're increasing our donations, the more donations we get, the more research we can support. So there's a beautiful pattern there. So we want to look at um, how we're going to, as part of the launch, if you go onto our website, you'll be able to, for the Breakthrough Foundation, you'll be able to see um, a little bit more in detail some of these pieces of research. But the first piece of research was a roll around um, kicking bullying to the curb in schools. This is a, um, a project that's actually been run here at Flinders University called the Peace Programme. Um, though some of you might have seen it in the news um, last week uh, or the week before. Um, this is their first one of outcomes showing how they've reduced bullying in one school by 50% within its first term. Um, and over the next coming months, we'll actually have each of the researchers coming to present these pieces of work to you. The second one is looking about the well-being and resilience of the program, putting the programs to the test. Often people hear about well-being and resilience and think it's a bit of a buzzword. You know, it's very difficult to measure. Do I feel happy today? Do I feel sad today? Is my outlook positive today? Is it a negative outlook, etc.? It's quite difficult to try and measure and market that. If you look in, in the community now, there's a whole range of different well-being and resilience programs. You can go onto nearly any site and someone will be an expert in it. The challenge really is, is what's the evidence sitting behind that? What's the modeling that sits behind that? What's the outcomes you can really achieve? So we really wanted to drill down into this further and actually start to say, well, if we're going to be supporting a program and we're going to be supporting research, which would include the program that's taking place at the Adelaide Crows, is that really having the positive impact? Is it really making a change? Is it really driving outcomes? Um, then we've got the mental health in the palm of your hands, so that was the project that uh, Naranja Bidigari presented to everybody, all around the utilisation of your mobile phone, and how it's pulling data and is actually giving uh, clear and live data sets that will actually help clinicians do earlier interventions for people. And then we've got our eating disorders in your genes. Now I'm not the best person to talk about that for you today, which is why we've actually brought in the expert to do so. Um, so we have uh, Professor Tracy Wade, who is the academic lead for our statewide meeting disorder service. Um, and Tracy's going to do a short presentation for you on this very, really specific piece of work. This is an incredible piece of research that's taken place and has been driven here um, in partnership with three other universities, or with one of three universities. Um, it's going to be a real breakthrough, a true breakthrough in actually getting the earlier identification and early diagnostics for eating disorders. Now we know that the longer that takes place for somebody, the longer and the harder impact and the harder journey it is for a, a patient to overcome their eating disorder. So if we can actually drill and get this trigger at a much quicker date, the outcomes and impacts will be incredible. But Tracy will explain that in much greater detail than me. I've been uh, talking about the importance of genes in terms of increasing <coughs> vulnerability for eating disorders for over 25 years. But it's only just really now that we've got to the point that there's actually a way of breaking in terms of our understanding of the specific genetic contributors to disordered eating that will enable us to make a difference to the treatments that we, start, we are offering for eating disorders. And we still need to improve our treatments for eating disorders. 
Over 60% of people who do our best treatments for bulimia nervosa still have symptoms of an eating disorder at the end of treatment. We have good outpatient treatments for anorexia nervosa, but even the best of those, only 50% of people complete them, or 60%, sorry, and at 12 month follow-up, while 50% achieve a healthy weight, only 28% achieve what we call remission. In other words, there's still 72% of people who are experiencing severe psychological distress because of the eating disorder at that 12 month follow-up. This is not good enough. This is really not good enough. So it's imperative that we can identify the influential risk factors to target in order to improve our treatments and in order to strategically develop our treatments. And using genes to elucidate the biological basis of eating disorders, <laughs> in conjunction with identifying the key toxic environments, can spur the development of effective new treatments or effective new adjuncts to treatments for really difficult disorders. The picture that you can see here is a picture drawn by one of the clients from the Statewide Eating Disorder Service. And it just shows the absolute difficulty of taking that one more mouthful, of putting that food in your mouth, and the whole body is screaming and your whole mind is screaming, no, don't do that. So we need to start to harness biology in order to overcome that really strong signals that the body and mind are sending. So as I said, we've known for a long time that genes are play an important role and contribute as much to eating disorders as the environment does in terms of causing eating disorders. But why has it taken so long to identify specific genetic loci? Well, when you're doing genome-wide approaches, which basically represent an unbiased search for uh, loci that differ significantly in a group that have an eating disorder compared to a group that don't have an eating disorder, it takes a really, really, really large sample to get that information, to detect those specific genetic loci. I've got an example here from schizophrenia. In 2009, the 3,000 cases, 3,000 people with schizophrenia who had given a biological sample for genetic testing, there were no genetic loci that we could identify. I say we, I say the royal we, not, not specifically me. In 2011, with 9,000 cases, we started to find, to detect specific loci. We got up to five. In 2012, with 14,000 cases, we are up to 22 genetic loci. In 2013, with 31,000 cases, 78 loci. And in 2014, 38,000 cases, 128 loci. So there's a very clear relationship between the larger the sample size the more of these genetic loci we will identify. And there are many of these genetic loci for these complex psychiatric disorders. There are gonna be hundreds, if not thousands, that we have to detect and try and understand. So we're at the beginning of that journey. And now it's the turn of eating disorders. We've finally um, been able to publish something last year which has started to identify specific loci as you can see, we had about 3,500 cases and 10,000 controls. And this study reported significant genetic uh, overlap between anorexia nervosa and schizophrenia, and also neuroticism, as well as important metabolic indicators, such as insulin and glucose. So we're starting to understand that anorexia nervosa is not just a psychiatric disorder, but there's also perhaps important metabolic issues that may predispose people to developing anorexia. And in 2018, we're going to publish new findings, a new sample, which gives us even more important and exciting information. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what that is. 
because it's under embargo until it gets published. But uh, this is a picture of Cindy Bulick, who is uh, working in the United States. She's been spearheading this work. But we have been able to contribute to this work through what we call ANGI, the Anorexia Nervosa Genetics Initiative. You can see that a number of countries were involved in this initiative. Australia was one of them. And this work was supported by a, a family in the US called the Klarman Foundation. And the Australian side, the Australian ANGI team, um, involved Nick Martin from the Queensland Institute of Medical Research, Grant Montgomery, also from there, myself, and Richard Parker and Anjali Henders. So there were teams all around the world, and this is a real, I guess, defining characteristic of this type of work. It's never going to be done at one site. It involves international teams, international collaboration, data sharing. It's very dynamic. Um, and it's very collaborative, which is very exciting. And now, Angie is about to become edgy, <laughs> which is the Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative. The Klarman Foundation have ceased contributing money to this, but now what we want to do is collect more data on the people that were part of our Angie sample. We want to go back to them and really figure out those components that define anorexia from genes right through to emotional expression. We also want to get poo samples um, and that's because we're interested in this metabolic pathway and what's happening in the gut with macrobiota. So we're trying to figure out is there something that's happening in the gut that might predispose people to anorexia nervosa? If there is, then that opens up a whole lot of new thinking about how we might be able to help protect people against the development of anorexia nervosa. We also want to expand this cohort to collect um, samples from people with other eating disorders like bulimia nervosa. So basically we want South Australia to become a leader in this work, not just one of the many contributors. And we um, basically want to do this new work with the support of Breakthrough. Now, it's not just about uh, doing GWAS. We believe that in South Australia, we also have the capacity to translate this knowledge and to actually develop new treatments with this knowledge. And so I want to introduce to you one of my colleagues, Sarah Cohen Hoods, who is sitting uh, in the audience with her hand up. She works with me in the School of Psychology at Flinders University. And some of the work that we're just um, starting to plan for is looking at the effects of all the small individual genes that contribute to a complex eating disorder. I told you that there were many. And uh, GWAS is not the answer to everything. It's not going to pick up all of those genes that have small signals. So it's really um, turning to new techniques in the field now. And one of these is polygenic risk scores, which can have a paradigm changing impact. It may allow us to look at the prediction of eating disorder onset and the course of this disorder. And we actually have a sample, um, if this is work you can do with smaller samples of adolescents that we followed through over adolescence, looked at onset and course of eating disorders in that group. So we're keen to get on with that work. Sarah is also an expert in epigenetics, which essentially answers the question, which environments switch genetic action on and off? One of the epigenetic switches found across a variety of areas is diet. Diet, restriction, not being nutritionally healthy. So I guess one of the questions that comes to mind is the diet that a lot of teenage girls go on why does that become a free fall into anorexia for some and not others? Can this work actually help us detect who is most at risk and does that actually indicate interventions that we can use with that group who become obsessed and committed to not eating? We also um, have the ability to look at gene environment interactions. And this is uh, some work that we published last year in the British Journal of Psychiatry. We looked at peer teasing 
in the environment, the degree to which people had experienced peer teasing. And we found that as peer teasing increased, so too did the contribution of genes and non-shared environment. In other words, for those kids who were genetically susceptible to disordered eating, peer teasing about appearance was a really toxic environmental trigger to trigger that genetic vulnerability. Other kids who didn't have that genetic vulnerability could receive the peer teasing, but it didn't turn into an eating disorder. So that is a very nice example of telling us about an environment that we need to focus on in our interventions. And that's the work that we can also do here in Adelaide, and it's work that we've been doing for a while now. And this is an example of one of our intervention packages, Media Smart. You can see it describes it as it's designed to help you make your own decisions about which pressures in life are worth paying attention to and which are not. The pressures around appearance, around who I should be as a person, about what I should do with my life. How can you make up your own mind on these things rather than succumbing to pressure? This is a, a package that's been rolled out into schools and show a very good impact on protecting people from increases in weight and shape concern over a two and a half year follow-up period. This is um, an, from our online site now with Media Smart. We've now adapted it for uh, young women who already have body image problems and are at that early stage of disordered eating. And we've been getting very good results with this at one year follow-up compared to another online package, um, showing that it produces very uh, good decreases in disordered eating, decreases in um, the impact of the eating disorder on people's lives, and it increases help seeking, people deciding to go and seek help for the problems that they're experiencing. So I think we're in Adelaide, in South Australia, we're in a great place to catch this breaking wave of developing understanding about the genetics of eating disorders and ways of translating that. So I think working together in international collaborations, we can place South Australia on the map as a major contributor to developing effective interventions for eating disorders. Thank you. Does um, anybody have any questions to follow up with Tracy? Has there always been eating disorders? We think, yes, we think there have always been eating disorders. Um, we, I sometimes present the case studies of some of our saints. Uh, St Catherine of Siena, I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she died of causes related to starvation when she was about 31. She was a, sorry, that was my phone. <laughs> it never goes off, and I can predict that's my husband because he's the only person that rings me. Um, so St. Catherine was a very bright, very capable woman, and um, she was left a lot of uh, religious writings. She was very invested in perfectionism and um, about self-hatred, and she would not eat. Uh, she would only have daily communion. If she ate more than daily communion, she would stick a twig down her throat in order to bring, bring up whatever she had eaten. And um, so she, she died at age 31 because of starvation, um, causes related to starvation. So we think it has been there in different settings um, at, at all throughout history. It's just that we've become more aware of it and starting to look for it. People like her, and that's why people get anorexia because, yeah, people get anorexia because they feel that it gives them some type of purity and some type of um, self-esteem and self-worth, and um, so it it, that, which is why we call it an a, an ego symptonic disorder. It, it um, appears very attractive in a lot of ways to people because it represents some very um, on the face but very admirable personal traits. The only problem is it's very destructive and it kills you. 
any other questions? Any questions specifically around the research that's taken place and the sort of leadership that Flinders University are driving? Uh, is the research just at all focused, focused or are you looking at uh, we will take bloods from anybody, so um, as long as they've had an eating disorder. I think the lower age in this was 14, and that was just because of you know parental consent and all the, the issues around collecting DNA. The sample that we are working with, this sample that we followed up, uh, were age 13 to 19. So we're very interested in um, adolescents because you know. Uh, particularly trying to marry the genetics with what's happening over adolescence that um, basically puts people in that very high risk situation for developing an eating disorder. So we absolutely need to, to focus on that group. Yep, boys definitely do get anorexia nervosa. Uh, and we can certainly get them here as inpatients. Um, it's my impression, and Randall, Dr. Randall Long might be able to correct this, but for boys, often it's a more severe dose. When they get it, they, it seems to overlap a lot more with uh, obsessional compulsive disorder and obsessionality. And, um, you know, it's the same, it looks the same as it does in girls. Uh, but often with the boys, it's, it's almost like they, they have that more severe and comorbid cause, which really uh, places <coughs> challenges for treatment. At the moment, um, we say that about one in ten people with anorexia are going to be male. And um, so it's, it's really, it's, it's a big issue for boys. And it's, they also have the, the disadvantage of having a disease which is seen as a girl's disease. So sometimes it can slow down detection or diagnosis. So I think the pathway for boys sometimes can be a bit more difficult. And we need to understand that this is something that can influence and impact on males and females. Um, it's not just associated with one or the other. Any other questions? Question. Is the research on the genetics, is that more to do with about which genes are being turned on and off with the environment, or is it to do with the genes the actual person has inherited? It's, uh, we would hope to do both here, but the, the ANGI work is looking at the actual genes that the person's inherited, and I'm sort of looking at Sarah here for affirmation. Um, but that's why I want to do the epigenetic work, because that's only a small part of the picture. Well, it might be a big part of the picture, but it's only part. And we need to understand those environments which um, are going to, to impact on that. So um, Sarah has a nice example of music on the page. So you've got a musical score, but people interpret that differently. So you know, if you've got Bach's cello, solo, cello uh, work, it can sound quite different depending on who's playing and how they've interpreted it, even though it's the same music. And that's what happens with epigenetics, same the genes, but because the expression of genes is different between people, what actually the outcome is is different. So that's why um, in South Australia we don't want to just stick with which genes, we want to understand uh, which are getting turned on and off, which are the environments, we want to put the whole package together. Yeah, so could you look at a person, people that have had anorexia and that are in a recovery mode? Yes, yeah, we, we, anybody that's had anorexia at all um, is very informative for our study, even if they don't have it anymore. Yeah. Sarah, did you have Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think Flinders is very well placed in particular for the environmental aspect and the epigenetic aspect, because the issue you've got with these large consortia is a lot of people are collecting <coughs> cohorts um, and data on, on individuals, but not much environmental data, and it is critical in psychiatric conditions. We know that geno well, genomics is extremely is an important contributing factor, and that's something that a lot of Tracy's work has picked up on. Mm -hmm. um, what about the role of advertising? You know, the beautiful body is beautiful, both beautiful, everything, the, the, the fairy tale wedding you just had. Um, do the girls want you that? Which is something that you need to Yeah. And that could be like that. That's one of those pressures that we talk about in Media Smart because um, the advertising is a pressure. It uh, depicts a certain way of looking. 
and, um, and a very specific way of looking. So um, that is, we know that that's endemic. Uh, we also know it does have an influence. There was an interesting study in the Czech Republic uh, done when they went from being communist and the wall came down, um, and they had no advertising before the wall came down. So they were all sort of, you know, good communist um, in the surge and cotton, whatever, and not much uh, focus on body. Once the wall came down, Western style advertising much more prevalent, and the incidence of anorexia nervosa increased. So we know that it does play a role, but again, it plays a role in genetically susceptible people. And um, so that's where Media Smart comes in, is to try and protect people, uh, to make them understand uh, about advertising, about the tricks of advertising, why it's not obtainable, and how to resist that pressure. Tracy, do you want to add there um, the piece of work that the university has been driving in relation to perfectionism, which then links into that sort of question, which is, you know, about how do I get that perfect image, that perfect outcome, and how do I become perfect, etc. So another one of my um, um, research areas is perfectionism. And the reason we're interested in that is because it predisposes people to a number of psychiatric disorders, anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders. So we've been having a bit of fun working in that area for quite a while. And uh, we've published a therapist manual and a self-help book for adults. But we're also now doing a lot of work in high schools and primary schools on helping kids understand the traps of perfectionism and why it's not actually obtainable nor desirable. So we're currently just uh, conducting a program in a, a local high school which actually called us in because they realised that all their really high achieving kids weren't achieving as much as they had hoped. And it's because these kids get frightened of failure, these perfectionistic kids get frightened of failure and they stop trying and they underperform. So they actually welcomed us in and we're now evaluating that. But that's another important piece of the puzzle for eating disorders, that perfectionistic um, desire which has becomes quite obsessional. So again, it, uh, this information does point us to very strategic targets for interventions. So we actually get more bang for our buck. If we target perfectionism as opposed to something else, we can hope to see much better results. What part does Parkinson's play in eating disorders? Parkinson's disease? Yeah. Um, the, it, may, it may, I don't know if it does. We know that things like autism and Asperger's pay, share some genetic vulnerability with anorexia nervosa. Um, I'm not aware of the literature on Parkinson's, but that's why the GWAS work is so important, because it can detect any shared pathways with something like Parkinson's. And it might actually indicate something that might be helpful. So a good example is that uh, some medications that people use for Parkinson's actually is helpful to, for anxiety, to help people expose themselves to the thing that makes them feel anxious. So that's um, something that's been emerging over the last few years, and this is why this work is so important. It can indicate novel biological pathways that um, drugs that are developed for other disorders that we might not have thought to have used could become helpful. So there is work that could be done on using drugs from Parkinson's to help people as they're exposing themselves back to eating and refeeding. Maybe that will make it easier for them. So it could be something that becomes important in the future. The picture behind um, is a new vision for Flinders Foundation. Um, 15 years ago, there was a vision that wouldn't it be incredible if you could have an arena, an environment, in which you actually brought together the world's leading researchers and clinicians in cancer. And we're now sitting in it. Um, it's been operating now for 10 years? Ten? Nine? Six? Oh, more than I think. I'll come back, drop on for you. We opened it six years ago. The, the aim, the outcome of that was, was to have that vision, would it be incredible to actually look at each individual person, each individual cancer, and actually have a treatment plan for that one person? And by having the clinicians and the researchers in that one arena, you could start to ask those questions. You've heard about the passion of, of Tracy and the team. 
You've seen there that there's this opportunity to continue to drive and be right at the forefront of eating disorders. We've actually got some incredible clinicians sitting in the room today. We've got um, Dr. Randall Long, Randall. and we've got Emma, we've got Graham. These are some of our leading clinicians that are here within our eating disorder services. Our vision is to then develop the opportunity of having a new Flinders Centre for Innovation in Cancer, but in the eating disorders arena. Would it be incredible if we were able to house our community um, clinicians, um, increase that um, cohort to then be able to take on the paediatric service delivery, and then have our researchers sitting in that same arena to actually drive individual research and outcomes for our consumers. And it's a piece of work that the Flinders Foundation have been having this conversation for about five years now. And we're now at the point of um, being developing and actually coming up with our brand new scope and our new model. We're working very, very closely with the South Australian government um, on the allocation of the parcel of land. This is all now part of the redevelopment of the Re um, Repat Hospital. And we are one of the partners that are going to be engaged in the actual development of the new eating disorder service that are building there. It's an exciting opportunity to drive at the forefront of eating disorder work, and one that we're very, very proud to be involved in. We will be sharing more information about this. We'd like, obviously, to gain as much support as we can to drive that new concept. So if you'd like to have a chat with me afterwards, I'll be standing at the back. Okay. That's my sales pitch. I had to add on to traces. But what about the other impacts we actually have? We've spoken about how we go from a piece of research and it taking 17 years to translate into clinical practice. We speak about often, well, if I was to make a donation of a dollar today, what would I actually get from it? So today we want to actually show you what you actually get for that dollar. Okay? You might have noticed then, we have a little guest. Can we bring Bonnie up? Is that right? Just missed you to show you. Yeah. You're going to forget everything you just heard in the last 40 minutes and just go, oh. <laughs> Hey, Bonnie. Say hello. Say hello, So, please meet Bonnie and Jenny. Um, both of the members of the team um, are part of the therapy dogs team from Delta um, who come into our eating disorder services. Now, they've just started this program, um, and the piece of work they're actually looking at is actually trying to look at the reduction of the distress that takes place for a person who's experiencing eating disorder during their program. Now this might be post-meal, this might be post-group, this might be pre-going into group, it might be your first time you've actually arrived in, in the eating disorder service. And anybody that goes into any clinical arena, it's not a place you really want to be, let's be very honest. So we've looked at a range of different strategies about how we can actually reduce the, the distress that takes place. And pet therapy is one of those pieces of work. The second piece of work, okay, thanks very much. Second piece of work there is this very not quite as sexy, not our cart. Um, so our cart here, this is a, called the sensory modulation cart. Now for most of you it looks like a filing cabinet, and it is a filing cabinet. But when you actually open it, it's got a whole range of different tools inside of it. So the range of different tools are all the range of different strategies that our clinicians put into place with our patients to actually reduce any anxiety or distress during their treatment. Now this can be taking place when you're having an assessment, it can be taking place while you're going through that treatment plan itself, or it could be you've actually been admitted to our eating disorder ward, and during that period of time there's high levels of distress associated with the hospital admission. So there's a range of different tools. Now some of these tools are really funky little things. Are you going to want the bottom Yeah. So there are things about that, that um, being tactile, being, being squeezy, being able to th not hopefully throw. Um, there's a range of things then that are actually activities you can use, so that there's artwork in there, there's actually music in there, there's a whole range of different strategies that are all there to try and reduce the distress associated with hospital admission. Now we don't just use these in the eating disorder services, we actually use these in the emergency departments. And this has shown a, a real positive impact on the distress that's often associated with acute illness. We also then um, have been very fortunate to have a creative writing group that takes place in the Eating Disorder Unit. They produced their first poetry book, and I did mean to bring one down with me, but I'll bring some for the next um, forum and people can take them away. Um, the creative writing group has been operational for a couple of years now, and it's been done um, in partnership with Arts in Health. 
And um, they've managed to come up with a whole program and a, and a booklet of, of really exploring the personal impact of having an eating disorder through a whole range of different types of poetry. It's an exceptional piece of work. Um, and then finally, um, we've got the link then to back to research. And if we're looking at driving research and we're looking at driving change, we have to actually have to have really, really good PhD students. We actually have people who've got a passion and a drive who want to make a difference. So today we want to actually talk all about um, the Lauren Karina um, PhD scholarship top up. Now most PhD students then get an allocation. We've been very, very fortunate to actually uh, be given a, a, a donation to purely invest in actually supporting a student to take that next level with their research. Um, and it's really in honour of Lauren's life. Lauren um, and her father is here today, Mario, and we're very, very grateful for Mario's um, partnership and advocacy for eating disorders and, and for also for his support through Breakthrough. But we wanted really to actually look at, and we didn't just want to take a donation off Mario, although obviously we did, but we actually wanted to actually translate that to something really important. And what was really important when we got to meet Mario and Patty's wife was, was family. And it was also to actually honour Lauren in a way that she was passionate about life, although she had an eating disorder for a long period of time and it had such a negative impact, she couldn't cope with the trauma of it and unfortunately lost her battle. Mario didn't want that to be the last thing people remember about his daughter. He wanted to remember that beautiful smiley face, that engagement she had, that passion. So she was also passionate about animals, hence the pet therapy, and she was also passionate about learning and trying to learn new things. So we want to really today to launch Lauren's scholarship. It's actually been um, driven now by the university. There's going to be a new advert coming out for it. Um, and it's going to be managed through um, the research committee. So each, uh, there'll be an allocation of a successful student for the next three years. Um, and it's something that we couldn't have actually done without uh, Mario's kind donation. But it's also that if we haven't got incredible research that people want to get behind, then we couldn't have that scholarship in the first place. So we really want to show that connectivity, that your donation isn't just about that piece of research, although that's vitally important. We've got research then that drives clinical change. We've got clinical change that comes up with new inventive ways to impact and, and have an intervention with people. And we've got the opportunity to keep that cycle going. So we really want to show that connectivity with that dollar comes in and just think how it actually grows, which is absolutely incredible. I'm very, very thankful for that from you. Hello, everyone. My name is Emma. I'm the team manager for the State Eating Disorder Service. Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, my job this morning is just to give a sincere thanks to Mario and to Pat and their family for the extraordinary uh, donation that they've made through the Flinders Foundation, which is supporting our patients on a daily basis. Um, and we look forward to working with you again into the future. Uh, it was just quite really important for some of our day program uh, participants to, uh, for me to pass on a message of thanks to you and Bonnie. Um, our therapy dog is a weekly visitor to our program down at Brighton where we see um, about between eight to 10 people who are living with uh, quite a severe eating disorder. Um, we support them four days a week and one of the fantastic things that we've been able to introduce to the program is a visit from Bonnie once a week. Um, and whilst many of you um, may have a, pet, have a pet at home and you're very fond of them and like to pat and cuddle them when you're feeling distressed, um, it is a wonderful thing that we've been able to introduce this lovely um, opportunity to have Bonnie down at Brighton for people who are really struggling and doing their best to defeat their eating disorder and to participate with Bonnie and just have a bit of fairy love. It really is extraordinary, extraordinarily meaningful to them. So thank you very much. I think uh, your daughter's passion for her dog um, is uh, being translated across into uh, the care that we're able to provide people. And likewise, the sensory cut, which is also helping people to relieve the distress that they're feeling on a daily basis whilst they're in their impatient unit. So thank you so much. You've seen the impact you can actually have within the mental health arena. You've seen the impact that your donations can actually make to change people's lives. Um, we've got a whole range of different strategies now taking place over the coming months. Um, it'd be really great to, for you to share these with your connections and your colleagues. Um, and also um, to come and join us in some of the activities which will also be really, really good fun. So the first one is we have the uh, Cameron Fitzgerald lunch. Um, this is the lunch that takes place uh, in relation to our uh, child protection services. Um, and we're really looking about to raising funds and awareness about the vulnerability and neglect that's often, often associated with uh, younger children. 
Um, you're not too late also to get hold of your entertainment book. The entertainment book, um, if you see any of the Flinders team later, they'll be able to help um, and take you on the, the journey to connect into that new book. Um, and please don't be like me where you get the book and then never take it out with you. you know, take it out and actually make the most of it. Um, for the more athletic of you, um, there is the City to Bay Run taking place this year. Now, I believe this year it's also the first year that the dogs walking's been included. Mm. Yeah. All the dog fans are now nodding. Let's use it as a good fundraising opportunity. And um, we also have some incredible athletes in the room. So most of you know uh, David as our um, team runner. He's also running the New York Marathon. So you know, if he doesn't get a good time here, then you know, New York's going to be a tough go for him. Um, but if you'd like to join us, um, you don't have to run it, you can actually walk it. So if anyone would like to join me and walk it, so I'm not obviously as young and fit as David anymore, um, please um, give us a shout and, and take part with us. It's a great opportunity to actually share time and, and companionship, but it's also a great way in which you can actually generate um, donations to the foundation. And then we also then have our um, pink, yellow, blue ball. Um, this year is going to be even better, um, no pressure on Brooke at all from the team. Um, but we're really looking forward to the ball this year. Um, as you know, the money that's uh, generated and the income that comes from there is, is invested back into the research that takes place here within the Flinders Centre for Innovation in Cancer. And some of the outcomes that are coming from, from this centre are absolutely incredible. So if you can get behind us, if you know people who might want to come and join us, we have brilliant entertainment, fabulous food, and obviously you get to have our company. And thank you for joining us. It's incredible to see so many people here today. I was a bit worried when it was very foggy this morning that people might not be able to make it. Um, but it's been incredible you are here. Please stay around and chat to some of the team. Um, we'll answer any questions you've got and drive safely. Thank you very much.